Good evening, Your Excellency, Ambassadors, uh, honored guests and friends. We're delighted tonight to welcome to Syed Business School and to Oxford, uh, His Excellency, the President Ali Bongo Omdiba of, of uh, Gabon. As many of you know, we have a big emphasis on Africa here in the Business School and also you'll find out in other parts of the university as well. Uh, Africans account for only 2% of all the business students in the world, yet we know they're a much more important fraction of business leaders in the world in 25 years or so when all these young people become leaders in their own right, uh, an even greater fraction. We made a commitment about four years ago that 10% of our class would come from Africa, and we have uh, met or exceeded that goal each year for the last four years, thanks to hard work of our staff, including Tammy Rofi up here. Um, why is it so important? I think it's important because we need to help do our part to help the best Africans to come here to Oxford and have an experience that will benefit them, but equally important so the rest of the world comes to understand Africa better through experiencing it through the students here at the school. We do that in a number of ways. We do that through the student body. We do that through a large event, the Africa Business Forum. We do that through collaborating with other student organizations. We do that by collaborating with our very good friends from across the university. And one of the ways that we do that is through a program called the One Plus One program, where you can combine an MBA with many other degrees. And one of those degrees that has been extraordinarily popular as a combination is African American Studies. Uh, African American Studies and, in fact, the African Studies Center is led ably by Professor Wale Abedebanwi, sorry about that, Wale, um, uh, who's the Rhodes Professor of Race Relations at the University, a fellow of St. Anthony's College, and the director of the Africa Studies Center, which since in the newly renamed Oxford, Oxford School of Global and Area Studies. Uh, Wally has two doctorates, uh, beats me by one, uh, one from uh, the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and the other from the other place, that's how we express it here, the other place, um, as a Bill and Melinda Gates scholar, and he's taught in both Nigeria and then most recently came from the University of California, Davis. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce Wally, who will in turn introduce our guest. Um, please welcome Wally. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the president. His Excellency Ali Bongo Odimba <laughs> has served as president of the Republic of Gabon since October 2009, having previously served as Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Defense, and a representative in the National Assembly. He's also the chair of the Economic Community of Central African States. Under his presidency, Gabon has played a leading role on conservation and the fight against wildlife crimes in Africa. Gabon contributed to the success of COP21 by becoming the first country in Africa to submit its climate action plan with a target to reduce its greenhouse gas emission by 50%. He is the current coordinator of the Committee of African Heads of State and Government on Climate Change, the African Union's highest authority on climate change issues and was instrumental in launching the African Adaptation Initiative, which seeks to mobilize funds for climate change after adaptation projects. Just last week, the president announced that his government will require all Gabonese forest concessions to be Forest Stewardship Council certified by 2022. He is also a founding member of the Giants Club, a forum that brings together African heads of state, global business leaders, and elephant protection experts to secure Africa's elephant populations and the landscape they depend on. It's my pleasure to introduce the president of Gabon. Please give the president. <laughs> Professor Tufano, Professor Adebangwe, distinguished uh, faculty, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is uh, indeed a great pleasure to be with you uh, late this afternoon in Oxford, a place where bright, ambitious people gather to apply their minds to the world's most complex challenges. I'm here today 
to share my experiences, you know, as a head of state in a country endowed with uh, exceptional natural resources. I'm committing to developing them in a way which unlocks value for our economy and uh, society and also protects the natural environment. I'm looking forward to exchanging ideas about the practical realities of balancing these different priorities. I welcome your views on uh, business models that work elsewhere in the world and that you think could, or we could learn from in Gabon. By uh, 2100, as many as one third of all people, almost four billion, will be African. By 2030, over half of the new workers entering the global workforce will come from Africa. Any serious global business developing, a future strategy must have an African strategy. People who really understand Africa, our politics, our economies, our societies, will become increasingly valuable to senior decision makers in both public and private sectors. The way the big issues, demographic change, natural resources, scarcity, food security, climate change, techno technological disruption play out in Africa will shape global security and prosperity. More people have more at stake on our continent than anywhere else in the world. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly where to start. One of the biggest challenges Africa faces in the mismatch of education, skills, skills and employment opportunities, until we fix this, our economies will remain and competitive and social inequality will soar. The African, the African students in this room, you, you are building the skills, knowledge, networks that we need to transform our continent and create global impact. But you can't do this in a classroom. You need to stress test no theory in real life and apply your ideas in practice to see what's sustainable, what's scalable. Equally, African leaders need the world's best and brightest minds applied to our toughest problems. We need to be challenged with fresh thinking and new ideas to break the vicious cycles and overcome inertia. So let me uh, talk a little bit about how this, all this applies to Gabon. We have our own set of uh, complex challenges and an urgent need for transformation. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but what I have is a determination to move Gabon from an oil-dependent economy, vulnerable to external shocks, to a fully diversified competitive economy with world-class cap capability in forestry, sustainable tourism, mining, energy, and new technology. Almost 10 years ago, we evolved a strategic plan we called Gabon Emergent to drive diversified and sustainable development and support a new generation of Gabonese entrepreneurs. For a country historically dependent on oil, you can say that it was a tall order to create new local, local value chains and industrials, industrial in an environmentally sustainable way at the pace I, was, I, was, uh, I saw was increasingly necessary to build resilience against a falling oil price. The urgency of action was high, but the force of inertia was very strong. Eliminating bureaucratic inefficiency and modernizing the workforce sound like good things to do, indeed. But it's only when you start dismantling systems that have fostered impunity and making poor performance for decades 
that you start to realize what you are up against. Transformation of societies, economies, businesses, individuals, you know, is very difficult. It's tough. It sounds neat in a speech or in a business school case, you know, study. But in real life, it is messy and very frustrating. Overcoming inertia or vested interests that are determined to maintain the status quo requires courage and tenacity in the face of criticism. Often the benefits of structural reform are only recognized many years down the line, sometimes after you're gone. But we can't, we can't, wait, I mean, we can't afford to wait for progress. We are transforming the wood sector, building the tourism sector, developing the blue economy, and we're now exploring app options to develop renewable energy. Our plan is to shift to 80% hydroelectric hydro energy with the remaining 20% from gas. But I have to also add, you know, solar. We have potential to be <clears throat> able to become an ex a net exporter of energy. In everything we do, we seek to harness the power of technology. A new environmental monitoring center, part of the Earth Lab Worldwide Net Network, delivered in partnership with NASA and the Brazilian Space Agency, uses satellite technology to monitor our forest and water resources to identify the instances of illegal logging, mining, fishing, and poaching. So I'm determined to tackle these complex issues holistically and strategically, identifying the most experienced international partners who can really help us advance our agenda. So I've shared some of insight you know, into the ambition we have. The challenges we face and the approaches we are experimenting with. You are globally exposed. You spend your days studying innovation, searching for inspiration in developing new models of equitable development. So I also would like to hear from you and, uh, and what uh, you think, and also about other countries in, that are tackling similar challenges and how we might adapt these ideas for Gabon. Uh, just before you do so, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce one of your alumni, Pierre Ludovic Claude. You see, he's a smart young man who graduated from SBC last year and has taken up a role with Deloitte in Gabon, where he has been supporting us with the delivery of uh, the Gabon Emerging Strategy Plan. My ability to transform Gabon is really, really dependent on my ability to attract people just like Ludovic, to contribute their valuable skills and energy. And I hope that Ludovic can be the first of many of uh, an SBS alumni who choose to apply their, their world-class education to solving world-scale challenges in Africa. So if you want to have global impact, then come to Africa. If you want to be competitive in the future, start creating scaling businesses in Africa today. With the young, talented, networked people involved in the solution building, Africa can, can feed, light and inspire the world. So we are all counting on you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I'll use the benefit of uh, being up here with you to start with the first uh, series of questions, and then we'll go to the audience. Uh, you have talked about some of your accomplishments and uh, your plans. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know what uh, are the greatest challenges that you have faced uh, since you have 
been in power uh, since 2009, especially in the context of the accomplishments that you have talked about and your plans? Well, as, I, uh, as I've said, you know, the most difficult part was to change the mindset of people. You know, you come up you, with new ideas uh, and you think that everybody will, you know, understand and see the purpose, you know, what you're trying to do. And then you start meeting, you know, especially with the, your administration, and you, you realize, you know, some people that are just looking at you, and you don't see, they don't read the enthusiasm, you know, in their face and their eyes, they're like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> you know, we were just doing great. Why does he want to change all this? So that's why, you know, generally, uh, after an election, this, it is being said that you have six months, you know, to really uh, make the first, you know, the first reforms. After that, it's a real battle with all your own administration, you know, because, you know, people are comfortable with where they are and they really don't like, you know, when coming in with new ideas that they first do not really understand and first they have to think, well, is, is those ideas are going to change, you know, uh, well, the position that I have, the comfort I'm with, I'm, you know, with. So that's the first difficulty, you know, convince, you know, your administration, get people on board, you know, with the support of the people. Because you see, for the support of the people, you put the pressure on your administration, on your parliament, you know, to pass new bills. Okay. Mr. President, if you have so much challenges that you are, you know, having to deal with economic challenges and also economic plans, how are you able to combine this with also uh, facing the challenges of the climate? Because in Africa, as uh, has been said, the Gabon seems to be unique in terms of paying so much attention to the climate. I imagine that many people in Gabon will <coughs> argue that that's not the priority now. So how are you able to combine that with the economic challenges? You know, that there's a, that's, it's always been you know, the, um, the challenge for us. My commitment, you know, in the environment uh, started with just, you know, uh, a small story. Uh, my father came back from a trip, and of course I met him at the airport, and he said, you know, follow me to the palace. And I went there, and he said, well, I have something to show you. And he uh, put on the tape, and I saw this magnificent, you know, uh, pictures, you know, of rainforest. I was... I mean, wow, you thought you were like, you know, Garden of Eden, you know. And uh, he didn't say anything. I didn't ask him anything. And uh, after at the end of the, 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 the film, he told me, nice, huh? I said, yes. I said, wow, this, this place is incredible, you know. Oh, I have to visit. Where is it? He said, but that's your country. I said, what? He said, yes, this is your country. I never heard about, you know, those places. You know, and this was, was a shock. And uh, this gentleman sitting there, you know, does something to do with it, Professor Lee White, you know. Uh, and my father as, as also was struck, you know, I said, well, from then on, you know, we, we have to pass this on to a new generation and protect. This is how came the, the, uh, the, the decision to create 13 national parks, 11% of the country. Uh, because President Bongo wanted, you know, to make sure that future generation was also were also going to enjoy that. So we then, and of course, I, I, I jumped on board, you know, to create in Spain and to, to protect. So when I became president, I said, well, my challenge was like, I need to develop my country. I need, you know, uh, resources, you know, but at the same time, I have to protect. And uh, about that time, you know, I had to fly out the country for my first COP, and that was in Copenhagen. And uh, I always say that uh, I, came, I came out of that conference, you know, shocked. Because there we were, uh, about, you know, 30-some leaders. Uh, of course, the great, you know, nations, you know, and some of us in that room, unable, you know, unable to agree on a solution where everything was there. 
we knew that if we did not reduce the world temperature to two degrees centigrade, we were going to be in deep trouble. And because even the small islands, that number had to drop down to 1.5, and it was impossible, you know, to have an agreement. Okay, so we were there for two days. At the end of the day, President Obama was able to strike, you know, a deal, you know, with the Chinese, whatever. But, you know, it was a bad deal, but still. And I, with other African leaders, were trying to impress, you know, on the people, on the people that, well, we in Africa are not the ones uh, who created that problem but we might be the one to suffer from it, you know, pollution. Uh, we tried to get heard. We were, okay, a little bit heard. Some of us were able to talk, but then that bad deal, we had to sell that, you know, to uh, other uh, brothers, African, you know, and then we met, met them, we had the meeting with the African leaders and we had to solve you know, the deal. And it was not a good deal, but still, better than having no deal. But coming out of Copenhagen, I was struck. I said, well, we've got to do something. So when I got back, I immediately called uh, a meeting with the administration, business leader, NGOs, and I said, well, now listen, what I'm going to say I don't want anybody to say that's not possible. I say, we have concerning, especially the rainforest, we have to be able to, you know, maintain activity, business, but at the same time, preserve. It sounds difficult, but you guys, you have to meet and find a solution. Come back to me. And really, don't tell me it's not possible. I don't want to hear that. So we created what we call a, a climate uh, uh, plan, resulting you know, into a project where we decided uh, that uh, we could do that. And uh, following uh, these meetings, immediately we, we started uh, uh, passing new laws with you know, the uh, national land use, telling us exactly the percentage you know, that would go to parks, percentage, you know, that would be, it would go to wood industry, and so on and so on. And to make sure, you know, that this would work, you know, is exactly what I said in my speech. We ask, you know, partners to help us monitor, you know, the whole thing. Now, of course, it wasn't easy because, you know, we, we, were, uh, we were met with the resistance, first with poachers. Poachers, but uh, even in a, logging um, business. And following that, you know, I thought that uh, it was better to, to uh, shock people by taking, you know, a bold decision. So that's what I did. I said, well, from now on, no logs of, you know, timber would be exported without, you know, transformation in Gabon. It wasn't anything new. It just it was in our uh, in that court, you know, forest, you know, uh, court. But over the years, nothing had been done. So I say, if I if I go on, you know, telling people, well, you know, uh, I give you five years, six years, seven years, I say it's not going to work. And I wanted to shock also the wood industry, you know, that world. So I took that decision. Ooh, la, la criticism, you know, from everywhere, from uh, public, uh, private sector, uh, even uh, heads of state to tell me, you're crazy. And they say, well, you know what? You're finished. Why? Because what we don't have in Gabon, we'll get in other countries. I said, I don't care. Okay, let's do that, you know. Today, I'm going to make this, sh this story, you know, short. We were able to create a special economic zone specialized, you know, the wood industry. In doing that, we said, well, we want to exploit, you know, you know uh, and, and have it develop our wood industry uh, in a way that we are going to make sure that we transform in Gabon. 
We note that uh, we have uh, more uh, land, uh, forest land, you know, for exploitation, for instance, than a country like Malaysia. But Malaysia, for me, the wood industry is making more than us because out of just one tree, we were just exploiting not, not more than 40%, 60% waste. In Malaysia, they export over 90%, you know, making many times more than us. So when we started uh, the economic zone with the, 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 what in mind to develop, you know, a wood industry, we uh, invited companies to do that. And today we have over 80 companies involved in our special economic zone that were able, were able to uh, start and develop over a period of, you know, five to six years, which is unheard of, you know, in Africa. And uh, right now the uh, wood sector has created uh, more than uh, 10,000 jobs, new jobs. And uh, we also have, you know, uh, companies from uh, over, all over the world, even from Africa, and even Gabonese entrepreneurs, you know, involved. So this fight, you know, with the environment is not an easy one. Because we decided on our own that we were going to turn back, turn our backs to, you know, a lot of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars by not exploiting the forest. But what we understood was that cutting the trees in Gabon would have an impact in other regions, especially West Africa, where you have the desert advancing, you know, in some case half a meter a year, in some case one meter a year. For us to cut, you know, all our trees in what in the Congo Basin, you know, forests, to cut all these trees would have a terrible impact. Uh, when you look at the Congo Basin is the other, you know, world's you know, longer. The other one being the uh, Amazon. But the Amazon is already dam damaged. So we're trying to protect ours, and uh, we're talking to other countries uh, to have a, the, policy, the same policy you know, of uh, uh, preservation. Uh, think, uh, thank God, you know, we, we, we all think that way. But really, you have to consider that uh, those are hundreds of millions of dollars that uh, we're turning our back in. So that's why uh, we, are, we are really being strong in, uh, in all those COP meetings, uh, highlighting the role you know, of rainforest. And most of the time, it's being overlooked. And people do not realize that in our hands, you know, we have the future. Because if we do you know, cut all those trees, it's really going to be a major catastrophe. Even now, just to finish on that point, the climate change, if we're not careful, will result you know, in a shortage of water. And because of that, we might end up in a, conf a conflict of 21 countries because no water, it means no agriculture, it means no food. So it means climate refugees. Now, nobody has heard right now about you know, that term, you know, climate refugee. But this is what, you know, coming, you know, if we're not careful, you know. As, and then you realize that Africans would be the ones to suffer the most. But if we are, you know, faced with that problem, there will be another problem. As I said, with climate refugee, where do you think those refugees will go? To some African countries? But most of them will come here. Thank you. Uh, when I was chatting with Mr. President before we came out here, he mentioned that the Financial Times asked him some uh, uncomfortable questions yesterday, so I promised that I will follow up on that. <laughs> so we'll, we'll move from economic and climate issues to uh, politics. When you became the candidate of PDG on 19 August, uh, July 2009, you told the delegates that you were, and I quote you, aware of the legitimate concerns of the people and you vowed to battle corruption and, I'm quoting you now, redistribute the proceeds of economic growth as uh -huh. president. Uh -huh. Indeed, Gabon's oil re uh, revenues have given your con uh, the country one of the highest per capita income levels in sub-Saharan Africa. 
And some of your critics are saying that you have not fulfilled your promise to redistribute wealth. How would you respond to this? Uh, you know, unfortunately, no one talks about, you know, your victory. They're always talking about something else. My, I can tell you that if you see the figures, it's all true and it's all wrong. The political situation is interesting, you know, because uh, what we have is, is the same in other African countries. You know, when I ran, uh, my father just died. And uh, of course, uh, within the party, uh, some of you know, his uh, companions you know, thought that you know, it was their time to run. But in the party, they decided to you know, skip that generation and, and, and go to the younger generation, I mean, including myself. So most of the people, you know, the senior official, officials in the party, they, they decided then to support and back me up, thinking that I was going to continue with the same policies. And of course, I said no. I said, we need, we need a change. And then when I did say that and I did bring a change, they did not agree. You know, they were comfortable in their position and they thought that, you know, I was just a traitor. And I said, well, some of them told me, well, now why on earth you Ali want to change that? You know, you, 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 you took advantage, you know, of the, you know, the situation, you know, so why do you want to change all that? I said, well, obviously, we are going to live in other times, and then these ideas that, uh, that I'm you know, bringing about were also some ideas that my father shared with me. But you guys didn't listen. You didn't want to listen to what he had to say, but I heard him say, and I said, well, I'm going to apply them. So we then have a, a, a battle of generation that has lasted you know, uh, all by first term, and it's kind of an ending now. You know. And that's why I say it was difficult to implement you know, change. But we did implement change. Uh, and the, 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 the figures are that, you know, we were able to diversify the economy and then boost the oil, oil sector, which had never you know, enjoyed you know, such a no boost. And because we did that, we were able to cope better with the oil prices going down than other countries. Because you have some countries that were still dependent on oil, like 70 80%. Because we diversified the country, you know, we dropped the, 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 the oil um, uh, revenues, you know, by, or below 50% of our GDP, you know. So, and then the non-oil sector, you know, uh, enjoyed even a two-digit, you know, growth rate, you know. We were slowed down because of two things, oil prices and the burden of debt that we also inherited. So we had to deal with those things, two things. But overall, and you see from 2008 to now, we were able to maintain a 3.5 you know, growth rate, even including you know, the, the, the crisis when all you know, uh, prices went down. And uh, for a period of time you know, so long, you don't have many that were able to do that. So we have in a course of a uh, this term built more roads than for 20 years, more hospitals, you know, uh, uh, change the industry, boost the industry, start the trans transformation, wood sector, mining sector. Uh, uh, so really, if you really look at the figures, it's, very always, it's always easy to criticize, you know, but come to Gabon, you'll see for yourself if uh, we haven't done anything. Thank you. Um, the 2016 election was contested by the, uh, by the, the results uh, were contested by the opposition and they alleged that the elections were rigged and some international observers also uh, agreed with them. Um, what have you done to ensure the integrity of the next round of elections and to ensure well, that there will be less say, contestation? I have to say that uh, some observers also supported you know, the, the process. They said that it wasn't rigged. I didn't want to say much about those 2016 elections because obviously we knew that, you know, the opposition cheated. You know, we have examples where members of my staff went to some, you know, uh, went to vote uh, to a polling station. And in result, the opposition got 100 percent. 
where even some of my staff, you know, voted. Even they applied, you know, the, the same thing happened to members of my family. So we knew that two years later, we were going to have legislative elections and also local. Now we have the answer. Saturday, last Saturday, we had the first round of legislative election and local election. And it was a landslide for my party. Now the question is very simple. If I had really lost the 2016 election, you know, and prior to this, this election, I worked with the IMF, you know, because to get the support for our plan, economic plan. And following, you know, the discussion with our IMF, there were some tough measures, you know, you know, to put. And I announced some of them before the election. And even some uh, uh, IMF, you know, staff member kind of told me, Mr. President, they didn't say you're crazy, but they said, well, how can you take tough measures like that before an election, you know, cutting down some salaries, uh, slashing, you know, uh, especially in the, uh, in the administration, uh, more than 6,000, you know, what we call ghost workers, you know, out, reducing staff member even at the, at the palace presidency for 40 percent, and all measures like that that were not very popular. So some people said that was a political suicide. I said, no. Well, let me take the case to the people. So I took, you know, I spoke to the Gabonese people, explaining exactly what that meant. So if I had lost that election in 2016 and announcing those kind of reforms, normally I was going to lose the legislative elections. And uh, uh, my opponent boycotted the election, you know. He said that he, he asked, you know, the opposition not to participate. He wasn't uh, uh, listened to. Members of the opposition participated in elections, and you see, for the first time in years, they're quiet about the loss that they had, you know, they suffered, you know, this election, because they said that he, this, it was completely transparent and well-organized, and, but this time around, they were not able to cheat where they cheated last time. And we dis dis demonstrated that, because we, we meant that this time we changed things around and had observers, you know, even Gabonese observers, as well as, you know, African Union observers, and they were not able to cheat, and you see the result. So the mandate, you know, that I have for the Gabonese people is clear. Reform, reform, reform. Now, I would get in trouble if I don't do that. Mr. President, you are a member of the Giants Club. Um, this is very interesting, especially in the continent, which pe many people believe there are not many political giants. Um, there have been a lot of initiatives to <coughs> level of AU to a engineer continent, a major continental change. Uh, what do you think are the impediments to this a major transformation across the continent, and what do you think can be done in the near future to lead, especially in the area of human development, to lead to transformation in human development? in Africa? Well, we first have to realize uh, what we have. And uh, everybody recognizes that, you know, uh, wildlife is important, and you have many tourists coming for that. And tourism is important for us. So we got together and decided to say, well, we have to take major steps you know, ourselves to protect this wildlife. And the, uh, 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 the iconic, you know, uh, uh, is the, uh, the, the, the iconic one is the elephant. So we launched uh, in 2014 the uh, EPI, the Elephant Protection initiative here in London with the five countries and then there was a conference uh, later on uh, hosted by the British government to invite you know many more countries to support that. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm very grateful to His Royal Highness Prince of Wales 
whom I started, you know, working with in 28, 2008, you know, with his rainforest project, you know, that led us to, you know, to apply the policies that uh, uh, I spoke about early on. And then with him, you know, we moved, you know, to this problem of, you know, poaching and the ivory, illegal ivory trade. And uh, when, uh, after launching the API, we had a conference, as I said, also by the government, but with the participation of, you know, uh, Prince Charles and his two sons, you know, Prince William and, and, and Prince Harry. And uh, it changed everything then. At that time, before that, there was a big market for ivory in China. And uh, because of, you know, th this conference, we were able to bring more awareness, not only to African states, but also others. And after that, the Chinese government took a historic decision to ban, you know, uh, ivory uh, trade. Uh, unfortunately, where China took that decision, some other Asian countries, you know, are still operating, you know, this illegal ivory, uh, you know, chain. So, well, I won't talk about these countries, but we Africans also have to do our, our share. And uh, in EPI, we then decided that, uh, well, each country will have in its own national policy. Where Gabon uh, is concerned, you have to understand first, when talking about elephants, you have two kinds in Africa, the savanna elephant and the forest elephant. The savanna elephant is one country standing out, Botswana. Botswana is the country where you find the most, you know, elephant all over the world. For instance, it's just, it's just one uh, uh, ah. It's just one park. You have more elephants in that park than the whole of Gabon. So, and the president, uh, former president Kama, started a good job, you know, protecting the elephants. So we followed the lead. Now, when talking about Gabon, we have forest elephant. But Gabon is home to uh, more than half of the forest elephant. Because in other countries, they've been killed. So we then decided to organize ourselves. And uh, we really had to do so because our park rangers find themselves in a situation where they were being shot at by poachers. Poachers are becoming more bold and bold, and they open fire immediately. So we have to train our park rangers and, uh, and we thank the UK government because, you know, two times we had, you know, a training session uh, and also with the uh, US Army coming to train our park rangers, you know, to fight against, you know, these poachers. And uh, those poor park rangers had to follow, you know, uh, program for special forces. Uh, and uh, that wasn't really easy. In the case of Gabon, we have lost 30% of our elephants, you know, stock, you know. And uh, the fight goes on. So tomorrow we are going to meet so that everyone will be able to tell its own story where we are right now. If we see a, still a decrease or we were able to stop that. In Gabon, we have, we have been able to stop. And in some areas where, where there were no longer elephants, we saw elephants coming. You're going to find it maybe bizarre, strange, but across from Libreville, we have a peninsula, a nice beach area. So I have a small house now on the beach. And one day, uh, Dr. Lee White called, called me to say, well, uh, your garden has been destroyed. Mm -hmm. I said, really, how? Well, you were visited by some elephants and they took everything down, you know. So you no longer have your nice mango trees that was gone, you know. And we were very happy because it meant that, you know, elephants were back, you know, in, 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 in a place where 
they had disappeared, you know, for 30 years. So this time around, I was very pleased, you know, to have, you know, uh, uh, thieves, you know, coming into stealing my, my mango trees, you know. <laughs> so we were there successful in some areas and in others, no. Uh, especially on the border side, uh, we, you know, have been suffering a lot. So one has to understand that the elephant is it's just not uh, this beautiful animal, but it has an important role to play to, in regenerating the rainforest. Elephants disappearing, you'll see the rainforest going down, you know, disappearing. So that's why it's important to protect, you know, but not only elephants, but also other animals uh, in danger, especially rhinos. Uh, and we're really trying to get more countries, you know, to participate. Talking about the environment, you know, we had this concept of Green Gabon, but now we also have de developed the Blue Gabon. Because we also realize that uh, poaching, you know, also very, uh, very high, you know, in, uh, on the sea. And the uh, illegal fishing trade, you know, took place. And in Gabon, we have been hurt for the last, you know, two decades. Uh, and poachers from everywhere this time. China, Japan, Japan for whales, and we banned the killing of whales. And that was not easy, you know, because that would put a lot of pressure. The Chinese, but also Europeans. Now, Europeans come, you know, to steal, you know, tuna, you know. And uh, the damage is very high because it's between 500 to 1 billion euros over the years. So, but also we then decided to create marine parks to protect, you know, some, you know, uh, species parts, especially uh, we found that around the oil platform, something incredible, you know, is we're gathering, or, you know, of many fish. And uh, we were trying that we tried to convince, and, uh, and they have accepted some oil companies to use some of the platforms, you know, and putting up, you know, setting up, you know, hotels, and people could dive in and see all those fishes, you know. Uh, so because of all these things we have, we also created uh, uh, nine marine parks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even a larger uh, superficie than, than land. And that is not easy because to get people to participate is very difficult. Talking about, you know, uh, the sea. You know, we have in, in Gabon from, Ju from uh, June to September, we enjoy, you know, you know whales. And we have some of our uh, parks that on the sea where you can actually come to the beach and, and that day you can see and you will see on the beach elephants, buffaloes, and far you see whales. That is exceptional. So that's why we decided to protect you know, the whales. Uh, and there is a commission meeting every two years. And we were shocked that, you know, our brothers in Africa, you know, voted again the idea of making Southern Atlantic a sanctuary for whales. They voted against it. Most of us don't, don't even eat whale. No. And so that's why it shows you that it's not easy. It's not easy to have everybody coming on board. It's an everyday fight that, you know, one that we really committed on. Yeah, Mr. President, you appear to be very passionate about the environment, about climate. Um, I know you've met President Obama when he was in office. Have you met President uh, uh, Trump? <laughs> actually, I've not asked the question. I, actually, I, might, no, I have actually, another question, but I actually, just wanted to know. Actually, I met Donald Trump about four, five years ago, he was not yet president. 
Okay, but you've not met him since he became president. Uh, no, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the White House, no. Okay, but you, you met at the UN? Uh, yes, you know, you and I met him. And okay. he remembered that we had dinner together. Okay. Um, when you were speaking, you said, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm wondering what was your experience with President Obama and President uh, Trump in terms of having all the answers and in relation to the environment and climate? Now comes the time when he wants to get me in trouble. <laughs> well, President Obama... Uh, We, uh, I met him at the, the White House, and then we had a, prior, you know, prior to that, we had a phone conversation. And, uh, of course, you know, very smart. And, but he, he, he understood right away, you know, uh, problems, you know, in Africa. And, uh, uh, and especially, I, I, I explained to him, you know, what I was doing and the, the difficulty about, you know, I was having, you know, uh, with, you know, reforming the country. And he told me that's well, he said, Ali, there's only one way. You know, accelerate, go faster, even more reforms. Don't wait. I said, wow. I said, yes, you, because, you know, it's, you know you're going to be met, you know, with a resistance. So you want to go one at a time? Just go, boom, you know, boom. You know, so that's the advice he gave me. Uh, President Obama was also strong on the environment, and as I told you in Copenhagen, he really saved the day, saved the day. And we work very well with his administration regarding uh, uh, environmental issues, and also uh, energy, because you know the, uh, we had a, every two or three years a nuclear conference. You know, so we really worked well. And he, at the end, you know, uh, President Obama even uh, organized the first meeting. You know, in Washington, of you know, African heads of state, and with the uh, president of uh, 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 the United States. So, I did have you know, let's say, good relationship with you know, with uh, President Obama and President Trump. President Trump, as I told you, I had dinner with him five years ago, and actually, it was a very nice dinner, because Mr. President Trump, you know, at the time Donald Trump was telling me that he didn't have any experience regarding Africa that he would like to know. And he asked me many questions, can we do business there? You know, of course he was a businessman, you know. And uh, really, uh, there was only like three of us at that dinner. And uh, actually I enjoyed the dinner. And uh, I reminded him about that dinner and he remembered. Uh, but then of course becoming president, you know, a whole different thing, you know. So uh, uh, let's say he has surprised, you know, a lot of us. Uh, Mr. President, we'll take a, um, a few questions from the audience. Um, yes. I'll take a set of three questions. Um, can I? Yes, let, let me start in front. Yes, please. Do you have the microphone? Yes, to the guy in blue suit. No, <coughs> in front, yes. Your Excellency. Can you please identify yourself? Yeah, of course, yeah. I'm Ludovic Claude, um, a recent MBA uh, graduate student from uh, Side Business School. And um, I've just recently been working in Gabon for three months, uh, advising the government on financial infrastructure, uh, infrastructure um, for energy uh, project. I've spent three amazing months and, and I really, really enjoyed it. Um, my question is the following. Um, given the current availability of funding um, currently on the global scale, how do you intend to structure projects so that they are bankable and match uh, funders' requirements in such a way that the expected prosperity is also shared with the Gabonese on the margin of society. Okay, can we take well, two more? Can we take two well, more? Well, I will answer. Cause you want to answer? Yes, yes. Um, we had a, a meeting of a, a regional meeting uh, about uh, two years ago at the um, height of the you know, oil crisis. And then we decided that uh, we had to take measures, you know. Uh, so I approached, you know, uh, Christine Lagarde, the IMF, and I said, well, Christine, I want to have the support in IMF. You know, all these years, you know, actually, we, we, were, we kept in contact with the IMF even when we um, uh, determined the Gabo Emerging Plan. They, they, they knew, you know, they, they also supported. But that's the time I told Christine. I said, I want the IMF to support me 
in boosting my economy. Uh, I didn't want to take, you know, things, you know, step further, but I have this debt burden. So I want to reduce spending and I want to, you know, kind of be bold, you know, have new ideas. So I'm going to uh, put up, you know, a plan and then propose, you know, and uh, present it to you. So and you'll see if you can support it or not. So that's what we did. And uh, we were pleased to, to find out that the IMF said, well, okay, your plan is good, we will support that plan. Uh, the problem that we have is that over the years, you know, we have accumulated, of course, you know, debt because we wanted to develop ourselves, but also uh, the administration uh, got huge, big, you know, uh, civil servants, you know, it's just too many. And we have to reduce spending. And uh, so it, it's not easy. Uh, so we need also the support of the IMF, bring them some resources for us to help, to help us, you know, tackle this, these issues and then help us, you know, uh, in some areas, go faster on transformation. And also having the support of the IMF, you know, and the, is a clear message to the, fin to the financial, you know, uh, in the world, because no investors will come in a country if the IMF hasn't given the green light, you know. So restructuring as we're doing, you know, with the support of the IMF, and then now getting, you know, uh, the, the green light from the IMF, even a, rating also with the, today with her Fitch, you know, coming up. All this will help, you know, uh, for us, you know, attract, you know, the financial institution to come and support some of the projects that we have. Uh, and we have good projects uh, because we see what we were able to do, you know, in the wood industry. We want to apply the same in the mining industry and the same in oil and gas industry. So all these projects uh, are bankable, you know, very interesting. Uh, and uh, we we know that uh, we're going to have support from, for this project, and also very important, all these projects, you know, also completely in line with our environmental policy, you know, and uh, but we also understand that what is important for us in order to succeed is to be strong on education, because as we transforming diversifying the, you know, the, uh, the, our economy, we then come with a new type of jobs for which that we don't have, you know, the skilled workforce. So we then have to go and be strong in training programs and even change, you know, education programs to focus more, you know, on uh, scientific, scientific matters then you know, then literary, you know, literary, you know, literacy matters because you know, we were teaching more literacy than you know than 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 what is scientific. So in other words, we were graduating more uh, social sociologists, you know, philosopher, all this type, you know, you know, and these guys, these guys are the ones you not know, to to make revolution, you know, not the scientists, you know. So so you see, we we got ourselves in trouble for doing that. So this is a package and that will help us for sure uh, be able to present, you know, good projects, you know, for institutions and for them to support that. Okay, um, let me take one from this side. Um, probably a lady. Yeah, lady first. Yes, yeah. Uh, the lady at the back. Yeah. Can you raise your hand for the mic, please? She's here. There. Here, here. here. Um, thank you. My name is Cheryl. I am an elephant conservationist and I have been working on combating wildlife crime for seven years. Currently an MPP student at the Blavenic School of Government. So I am really happy to hear your, um, your um, sharing about your determination in saving the elephants. And um, I, we definitely applaud the Gabon governments in, in showing your determination for a long time as well. And in 2012, Gabon is one of the first Central African countries to burn the stockpile of ivory. And in 2014, um, as you mentioned, the EPI was formed. Um, it is, however, unfortunate that um, Gabon has still lost 30% of the forest elephants. Um, it is something that um, 
it's, it's, it's a global problem, and we understand that China has stepped up its effort to curb demand. And at the same time, uh, are we looking, is Gabon looking to step up the efforts in anti-poaching? And at the same time, the elephants is also facing another threat of human-wildlife conflict. Mm. Um, so how are you, are you looking into Botswana solution, such as forming a casa, uh, giving more land to the elephants in the future, or to, um, on sustainable <coughs> development? Well, Miss, uh, it just reminded me, you know, one of the big, biggest problems I had, you know, uh, this you know, support of the elephant. Uh, at one point, it was raised, you know, in a campaign, in a presidential campaign against me. Some people say, well, elephants are more important to, for the president than, than people. So I remember, you know, one uh, rally, someone said, well, Mr. President, since you care so much about elephants, why don't you ask elephants to vote for you? you know? <laughs> so this conflict is, is real. And uh, in the case of Gabon, uh, plus I think you know, it's, it's the case everywhere, we've determined in uh, and, and, you know, areas with parks you know, where elephants uh, you know, should have been you know, safe. Now, poachers coming into these areas killing the elephants. The elephants are leaving the parks. When leaving the parks, they come upon, you know, villages. And of course, elephants have to eat. You know, that's, you know, there your conflict. So I was trying to explain to people, well, help us keep the elephants in, within the parks. <clears throat> so let's work together to fight the poachers. Some of them come to you, give you rifles, you know, and ammunition to go kill the elephants. Some give you money, because sometimes they know they don't own the area, so they use you. So don't work with them, and please, any information is good information for us. So let's try to bring these guys down to justice. And in some cases, poachers, you know, have money, and they corrupt even uh, administration or officials. What you have to understand is that these guys just not uh, work on the uh, 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 ivory tra you know, trade, but also gold, human trafficking. So anything they can get their hands on. And we have noticed and determined this past year the connection even with the terrorists. Because terrorists, they also need money. So they support those kind of you know, trade. And and uh, dealing with, you know, uh, illicit gold, you know, so they have money, and with that also they, they corrupt. But uh, we have been working with the intelligence uh, uh, agencies, uh, French, Americans, you know, and we have, you know, organized, you know, operation, I mean, a common operation, and we were successful in dismantling you know, some of, uh, some of these, you know, networks, because you have now many networks, first originating in West Africa and coming down. And sometimes officials from some countries on the border, they also send people to poach, you know, because, you know, you no longer have elephants to kill in some other places, so they'll come to Gabon. But also then they look, you know, in gold uh, and other activities. So it's an ongoing battle. It's not going to stop. Uh, tomorrow we'll, 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 ab we'll be able to see the commitment of you know uh, other African countries. Uh, I was glad to see that uh, we got more you know uh, commitment from African countries, but sometimes as one leader leaves office and another one comes, it starts again. So it's which you have to always be you know put the pressure on everyone. And in some cases, you know, threaten some colleagues and say, well, if you don't, we're going to go out and, you know, and then, you know, tell everyone. Uh, but uh, again, I have to really uh, say that, you know, the, the importance, you know, of the commitment, you know, of the royal family here, you know, that really has been on the forefront, you know, to, to helping us uh, to, to, to uh, organize, you know, many of us and uh, Tomorrow, I hope that uh, we, the story that we'll hear will be a more a positive one. Can I take one question from the back? Oh, okay, yes. 
Thank you, Mr. President, for honoring the invitation. Um, my name is Njodin Donyema. Um, I'm a PhD in law student here. Um, my question relates to um, the question of democracy within your own country and on our continent more generally. Um, being at, the, at an institution of uh, educational excellence, one of the core theses of democracy is that uh, term limits are one of the key ingredients to ensuring that a democracy thrives. Uh, and that is a principle that is uh, seen within the Constitutive Act of the African Union, for example. Uh, and yet, uh, for all the progressive reforms that you've introduced economically, some of the, in my view, regressive reforms is to remove term limits uh, for presidents uh, in your country. Um, do you agree with the thesis? If so, why did you introduce the term limits? And at the, in the same breath, uh, what are you doing uh, in Cohort, co in cohort with your uh, fellow African uh, heads of state to ensure that more women uh, get into positions of leadership and ultimately the demographic uh, gender bias that we see in our executives on the continent uh, mm. does not persist mm. into the mm. future. Well, what you say, you know, it all sounds nice, <laughs> but it doesn't work like that. First thing, I did not remove the you know, term limits. I did not. Uh, and we don't have term limits. Uh, term limits, you know, I would say, frankly, that sounds sexy, but it ain't working. Because when you go into your second term, you no longer have any authority because people know that you're leaving. And your second term is a completely loss because starts problems in it for your succession and people within your own party and they start, you know, fighting and no one listens to you anymore. And we've discussed that, you know, with various African leaders and they all conclude to the same. Now, why, be, why is it still applied? It's because some African lead, leaders think that, you know, it's going to please you guys here. That's why they do it. But they really don't believe in it because on the ground, they see the difficulty, you know. And uh, so I don't believe that, you know, uh, term limits, you know, improve, you know, the democracy. I don't believe in that, you know, and we've seen that, you know, in many cases in Africa, that's not really. You need a certain time to apply your program. And that's not done, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a country where you have term limits. For instance, when it's, once you're elected, uh, if you're completely new, the first two years are going to be kind of bumpy for you to apply, you know, and start applying uh, your, your, your policy. And then as you start imp implementing, you have to think of your re-election. And that means that if you have tough measures, you know, to apply, you won't do that because you will, will be thinking of re-election re because you have a five-year term. So you are campaigning for your election, okay? You win, then you said, I'm going to. But then, no people don't listen, they don't listen to you anymore because they, say, they know you, you know you're leaving office and you have a tough time. So in reality, you know, in just two terms, you only have a few years really where you can work. Now, it is also fair to say that in most European countries, there are no term limits. And you can't say that these countries are not democratic. So you see, term limits is not really linked to democracy. I know you're going to say, well, in, in America, they have term limits. OK, fine. For whom? Only the president. Some guys are in the Senate. They have been for 40 years. And you know that the power lies in the Senate in America. So, so why not apply then term limits to everyone, to every electoral office? That would be then fair, and not just the president. And the, actually, the guy who, the, when he was a president, faces the toughest election. But he is the one, you know, where you apply terminations to, but you don't to the others. You can be in parliament for 30, 40 years, no problem. Why? Why? If you, and, you, know, you think that, you know, we should really uh, push the democracy, then it should also be applied, you know, to parliament. Because someone who's been in parliament for 30 years, he's very powerful. He's a senior you know, member of the parliament with a lot of weight. So the same, same thing should be applied to him. As regarding to women, uh, this is really a crucial point. 
And uh, we have passed a bill in Gabon to, to, to make sure that uh, at least, at least 30% of all officers, you know, appointed or elected, you know, should be, you know, given to, uh, to women, 30%. In cases, you know, in some cases, we uh, even have uh, more, you know, women uh, in key position. And that's in government, that's in our parliament. Uh, Rwanda has uh, succeeded into uh, applying 50-50. Uh, I'm sure that we'll get to 50-50 probably in a, the next decade or so. But we have to move, you know, from nothing, you know, to at least, you know, uh, 30%. Uh, but you know that... Uh, this uh, term issue, uh, you know, this term limit I issue, uh, will create problems, you know, in, in many countries, in African countries, and uh, and sometimes also, why do you see some countries removing this term limit? Is that ex-presidents in Africa have a tough time? Those coming into office, you know, first target the former president, and uh, and and it's very difficult. And you wonder sometimes why some some of them stay on, linger, because many ex presidents have a really tough time. So with the African Union, we we'll try to, you know, uh, use those former presidents, you know, some sort of a, a council of you know the wise, you know, and then we use them, we send them to submission. And that has changed, you know, uh, the status of uh, some former president because they are really given, you know, uh, they, they are, are really being uh, used uh, within the African Union sometimes to go mediate. So every time a president leaves office, he can come to the African Union and we are going to uh, make sure that uh, that president, you know, stays, you know, useful, you know. But, uh, you will see, and then you will observe, what you, this point that you raised was going to be a big problem in the future. Mr. President, I've been told that uh, our time is up. I will use my prerogative as the moderator to ask the last question, just to follow up on the question that was asked now. Well, on the basis of this- Just as I was warming up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the basis of your answer, uh, Mr. President, I would want to ask uh, if you think that the idea of time limit is uh, an idea, uh, an end in itself, or rather whether it was supposed to serve other purposes. Because when you look at the experience before the latest wave of democratization in Africa, it was precisely the problem of life precedent that caused all sorts of crises in Africa, political, economic, and all crises. So my, my question, my specific question is, how many years do you think are enough for a president to be successful in office in Africa? Well, uh, uh, I think uh, it depends, you know, on the, uh, the, the, the years in office. Is it a five year? Is it seven year? It depends on that. Uh, but, uh, and that also has been noticed, you know, in some cases. Now, you know, in, in, in other countries, even in Europe, but five years is really a problem, you know. So the two terms would be okay if you know you didn't have you know this this sword of you know the limit, because if you don't have a limit, you can do your job because people don't know when you're going to leave or not, and then you then can really, really succeed. If, but you have to, the, what you have to take into consideration, we do not as such have, you know, in Africa, problem of democracy. Uh, today, if really, really the people don't want you, you don't stay in office, you know. Uh, today, you know, with the internet, you know, people have access to all sorts of information and they can really uh, say what they what what they what they have in mind, what they think, you know. So uh, it's it's more difficult today, you know, to to stay on and to be a life president by just you know imposing yourself or cheating. It, it, sooner or later, it, it's gonna you know catch up with you, 
you know. So when uh, you don't have to go, I said, then you can really work because you have time to apply. And you, have, you, you, you have, you know, the, 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 the authority to do that, you know. But I would say that it depends on the, the situation of your country, you know, because uh, if you really, you know, in the mess, you know, so it might take some more years. But uh, I really want to say out here that, you know, we have made huge progress in Africa regarding democracy. And it's no longer an issue, really. Uh, the problems that we have uh, is very simple. I mean, any leader anywhere in the world, but especially more in Africa, you have to think of feeding your people and creating jobs. And more so in Africa because the population is young. Now, the problem we have in Africa is that you know what you have to do sometimes, but you're trying to please, you know, other countries. That's why I say that, you know, imposing, you know, those limits, this is something just to please the West. Because you think that in doing that, you are going to be more supported in Europe. But Mrs. Merkel, this is her fourth term. There's no mandate. There's no mandate here in Britain. There's no term limit in mandate you know, in Britain, no in Germany, no in Italy, no in Spain. So why impose that in Africa? Why? Just why? So, you see, we have many problems like that because we don't concentrate on exactly what we have to do and what really our people want. In many cases, really people don't care about you know, those term limits. This is a, a, a something uh, I would say that concerns more the elite because you know, if, you have a, if you have a limit, then I think that, well, I can be the next president. So it's really me because I have this ambition, but really the, the guy you know, in the street, what, he, what does he want? Good job, you know, so they can feed his family. So if you are able to perform, he doesn't care, you see? And that's what's important. But really, we need you, you know, the younger generation, to change the narrative. Because we, we became independent. And you have to say that and to realize that uh, we were not presented, you know, with the idea of, you know, getting independence, you know. We took it, and sometimes by force. And what we got, it was, you know, the independence from someone who was, who was really, of course, not happy. So the narrative about Africa has been a negative one. If you see what's been written, for the last 50 years, uh, it's so negative, you wouldn't even go to Africa. And this is very not fair, because I have to say here that in 50 years or so of independence, we have covered, you know, and uh, progress more than countries, you know, in centuries. Look at Europe. Look at France, Britain. <coughs> it has taken you hundreds of years, centuries to get what you are. And that's expected of us in 50 years of independence. Now, come on. And I don't want to be the mean guy here because, you know, to say that, you know, to remind some of you that you progress sometimes also, you know, with slavery. You know? So, free. Free, free workforce. And then colonialism. But we in Africa don't hold this against you. We're not, I'm not coming here to say, well, I demand, I demand reparation. No, I don't want, I don't want to do that. I'm just saying, well, treat me fair. Treat me fair, because where I am, you have been. And you have made mistakes. Now, come on, you have made mistakes. You cannot tell me that all was, you know, fantastic. You made mistakes. So you understand what we're trying to do. And we're trying to catch up, you know, and we have to go fast because right now it is going very fast. You know, 60, 60 years ago, some countries, you know, in some areas in Africa, never seen, a, you know, even an airplane 
Today, you know, we go to the moon and Mars and then with internet and so It is going very fast. So we just say that you have to be fair. And sometimes you're pushing us in a wrong direction and taking, you know, uh, uh, decisions that are not meant for us. Now, but you also have to, you know, be straight. And as this is what I always say, you know, when I meet some of our European colleagues, they say, well, if I come to you, tell me clearly, this is what I do, what I do, this is what I don't do. But do not, you know, be evasive and then go out, you know, in the press to really kill me. You know, sometimes some people have to be straight. And this is the problem that you have, you know, with immigration. People come to your place and you say, well, we're free, a free democratic society. Okay, come. And then they start trying to leave, you know, the way they do in their, back in their home. And you say, hey, wait a minute. But if you are told these people right away, now you come here, this is how you're going to behave. We wouldn't have you know, so much problem. And especially with you know, uh, fundamentalism. A Muslim coming here has to you know, behave in a certain way. You know, because the country welcoming him has laws, things, not so to have to follow that. And that's very important. But you have to realize that Right now is a critical time. As I said in my speech, 21st century, 4 billion Africans. If we don't work together, some countries with also the problem of climate change will not be able to feed their own people. And you're talking about, you know, those, those ships, you know, that, you know, when you see in the headlines with just, you know, 48 people on board and yet it's a real crisis for the European Union not knowing what to do with 40 people. Now, what are you going to do when you have 100,000? Bearing in mind that the Mediterranean is not an ocean. It's just a lake for me. <laughs> One day you cross, a few hours you cross. So when you see hundreds of ships Ships, you know, what are, we, what are we going to do? So that's why it's time to work now with us. And also, we have, you know, made the mistake in not coming to you united to say, well, you know what? Let's work on changing in Africa the, the, the problem in, in, uh, of uh, energy, for instance. If I take off from uh, Heathrow, whatever, and I decide to go to Germany, looking out of the window, I will always see light. But flying over Africa is dark. It's dark. So we have, you know, prob common problems. Infrastructure. If I want to drive, you know, from Libreville, you know, to maybe, maybe even Kigali, I can't. Now, how am I going to, you know, have a regional market when I cannot even reach a country? So infrastructure, energy. These are really two important, you know, items that where we think we should be working together, where you, you should be helping us, sending your companies to help us build dams, uh, create, you know, factories, whatever, but even giving jobs to some of your companies and giving jobs to Africa, you know. And some leaders have started talking about a Marshall Plan for Africa. Wow. Very sexy. We're waiting. But, but if really if we don't do that, we're looking for a big problem. Take. So you really have to take that in consideration as, you know, you are the generation coming up and finding the solutions. We have to talk, we have to discuss, we have to listen to one another. It's not a thing of say, well, I'm developed, you're not. It no longer works like that. And by having that attitude, you have opened the door, you know, for Asian companies to come. I'm talking to the Europeans one, you know, and don't complain because the Asians are here. And you come and tell us that, well, you know what, yes, be, be careful, be careful. So 
our, our, our obvious answer is that, well, you're worried that, you know, they will do to us what you did. But you know what? I'm going to hire you so as an advisor, so you tell me you avoid, you know. <laughs> and, okay. The, I don't want to keep you too long here, uh, but uh, uh, again, I'm very pleased to have been able to share you know, some ideas with you. And uh, I would just uh, invite you uh, to visit Africa you know, with a really open mind, you know, open mind. And uh, consider that Africa is still a place where any, everything could happen. It's, it's, you know, a fresh market, especially for Europe, is where things can really change. You know, we have all the resources, you know, that you don't find anywhere. You have them in Africa. So our message is that this time, come and make business with the Africans, you know, so that uh, we all can, you know, uh, talk about, you know, uh, 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 a brighter future uh, for all of us, and uh, knowing that uh, there are problems that, by working together, we can uh, find the solutions and then completely erase, okay? Um, thank you, Mr. President. One of the greatest joys of teaching and studying in Oxford is that you can ask a president to defend why there should be no time limits. Please join me in thanking Mr. President. Sure. You know, you know, I, knew, I knew that answering that question, question was going to probably to get me in trouble with some of you. And I said that, you know, you will see with some of my colleagues, all will say, no, 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 time limits are good, time limits are good. No one wants to touch that subject. <laughs> but you will see in the end that I was right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we all thank, thank Professor Adbwamwi for his great service here. And Mr. President, thank you so much thank for you. coming to spend time with us and ending with a challenge and an invitation to our students to work yeah, together yeah, yeah. to improve the state of your country and the continent. Thank now, you very much. Now, come to Gabon and stay in Gabon, okay? <laughs> yeah. And I hope you remember us fond fondly when you return. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.